Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series of podcasts that Menninger Clinic puts on that we call Menninger Mindscape. I'm Dr. John Oldham, the Chief of Staff, and it's my very real pleasure to welcome Dr. Laura Roberts. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. Uh, Laura is joining us today um, as the Joan and Stanford Alexander Award Lecturer at Baylor College of Medicine, and we're looking forward to that. Um, Dr. Roberts is Professor of Psychiatry and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, which uh, is a lot of responsibility, mm -hmm. but um, Laura has really become very well known for many things that she's expert uh, and has developed a leadership uh, and very wide reputation for. She's going to talk a little bit about some of those things today, although there are many things that we could spend a lot of time talking about. <laughs> Um, and the talk today is entitled, Well-Being and Professionalism Among Physicians in Training. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very interesting mm -hmm. area. So Thank you. We, let's take a little bit of preview peek <laughs> at what you may say a little bit later about yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. You know, I first got interested in this when I was a medical student myself. I had my first child in medical school, so I had the experience of being both a patient and a trainee in my medical school. And I became very sensitive to that dual role. I didn't have the terms, the language that we as psychiatrists have for it, but I appreciated how it just was different to both be seeking care and learning in the same medical school. And then I observed things about my classmates. I had a classmate I'll talk about today who moved above a pizza parlor, lost 50 pounds in the course of the first year and a half of medical school. Um, I was concerned about him, a male. I had another classmate who was sneaking vodka in the anatomy room because nobody could smell the over the formaldehyde of the anatomy room. Um, over time, I started observing how many medical students had health issues. It was clear they were not seeking care for them. And I began to think about the in invisible barriers to care. Mm -hmm. So I uh, did some early studies on this work. I then led to work with residents and also then with physicians. And I was interested in a few things. One is what are the mental health needs and the physical health needs of physicians in training? Um, how does their wellness affect their identity formation as young physicians? Mm -hmm. um, I was also interested in whether it's set in motion like the seeds of impairment for later uh, experiences in their careers. And then with my work in ethics, um, it just became clear that if you have role models that aren't seeking care, if you yourself are in distress, and are, as I say, thirsty next to the fountain. It's a wonderful phrase from a poem I once read. There you are, have all the ac potential access to services, all the expertise there, and yet you yourself are mm -hmm. in need. Mm -hmm. So what would be the impact of that? Well, so I started this work many years ago. I couldn't get it published. People weren't interested. Um, they, I was arguing that actually physicians in training were a vulnerable population. They couldn't see that. Didn't, um, didn't want to see it. Didn't want to see it. And now what's happened is there's been a kind of a growing literature looking at how a healthy physician is actually a healthy uh, caregiver and therefore provides better care to patients uh, because if we ourselves are attentive to, say, preventive health care, mm -hmm. um, we're more inclined to uh, make sure that our patients are receiving proper preventive health care. We also know from the literature that if you're shut down, distressed, you might make poorer decisions, you might not double check things, so there's an emerging literature looking at how distressed physicians maybe make more mistakes. And uh, so it becomes linked with professionalism and with safety and quality in the care setting that was never anticipated sure. when we first were doing this work, but it's an extremely important movement in medicine now. Yeah. Well, so among a lot of things, I would mm -hmm. say that there are two big aspects to that. Mm -hmm. One is in our day, you. Mm -hmm worked around the clock, there mm -hmm. was very little attention to what we now call the work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And the stress that goes with that was just assumed mm -hmm. to be what went with the job. Mm -hmm. So that must be part of it. But then the other part must be the stigma that accompanies right. an emotional or right. a mental problem right. that isn't something that even in our own field mm -hmm. um, physicians are comfortable talking yeah. about. Yeah, it's a paradox. It's a really interesting thing. My, my stepfather was a physician for 53 years like his father before him. And so his life was that they lived and breathed medicine. They lived at the hospital. They came home on Sundays for a little bit. Um, and 
I'm not sure they experience the same role tension and distress. You were a physician. Mm -hmm. That was your whole identity. So the paradox now is there's this expectation, idealized expectation, of work-life balance. You can be a complete mother or father or partner and a complete physician. And these roles do often are not fully compatible. So that's one really interesting tension that I think is more present now. And it's mm -hmm. a paradox. It's not what you would expect. Mm -hmm. But there's another issue that I'm really concerned about and several of us have been talking about is with all of the regulations around work hours, which philosophically I think are correct. We don't want to be exploiting our young trainees. But somehow in the process, the idea that service was the enemy, service to patients became uh, a, a drain, a source of distress, rather than thinking of the care of patients as our fundamental calling, mm -hmm. the joy of sitting with someone, helping them bear what they must in life. Um, that is a profound sense of sustenance for us. So I'm really concerned that this new model where the patient is the enemy, is distanced, is somehow the object that we service and that somehow that is an exhausting process. I think just the whole, it's an incorrect paradigm. Yeah, that's, that is such a nice way to think about it. And, mm -hmm. and you're editor also of a journal, Academic Medicine. And so you have a lot of papers that come in around what it's like to be working in the, in, mm -hmm. in the professional and academic arena. Yeah. Um, one, one of the things that, that we hear people talk about a fair amount is that this shift to what, as you say, is a very good principle mm -hmm. to have time to be with your family, mm -hmm. and to, yeah. un, to sort of unwind mm -hmm. and not be like we were, mm -hmm. you know, when I was an intern, I was on call every other night for, right. for yeah, a year. Right, yeah, me too, right. Well, mm -hmm. it was right, yeah. uh, and it yeah. wasn't possible to really do the job mm -hmm. in a good way. Right. So where, where do you land? Mm -hmm. But then people say there's an emergence of sort of an attitude of entitlement, mm -hmm. so that my time is my time. If it's an emergency, that's not my problem, mm -hmm. um, creeps in. Mm -hmm. In the way it sounds like you're describing it, it's thought about in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's almost like um, a hourly sort of by the hour work mm -hmm. rather than a profession. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not as cynical as some people are. I'm not saying you are, but I'm not as cynical about some aspects of this because I feel like if you are the human condition, suffering and illness, it affects all of us mm -hmm. and I think it's true for whatever generation we're in. We're appreciative of those issues. Um, young people haven't as large a life experience, but over time, I think that there's something about just being a physician, being in that role with other people that you just learn mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, uh, I'm not too worried about uh, the profession somehow becoming a trade mm -hmm. where there's not this deep sense of responsibility to the other human mm -hmm. being. I, I don't tend to fret over Good. that. Good. I think more it's up to those of us in leadership positions and in broader society, public opinion leaders, to be thinking about how we can navigate this challenge, which is we need to support young people in their formation as young physicians, not permit them to be as exhausted as we were, to be reflective about the role tensions, and to come up with safeguards. Mm -hmm. It's a risk situation, so you need safeguards. Risk of being emotionally exhausted, risk for the patients if you are exhausted and do not have sufficient sustenance mm -hmm. to be able to show up at work and be on and very, very confident yeah, and yeah. take care of them. But it's kind of us to, up to us to come up with safeguards. So really different models of taking care of patients in teams where there's accurate communication, mm -hmm. proper handoffs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that regulations, well regulations can cause us to be thinking a great deal about this. But regulations will never replace the deep sense of being a professional yeah. and being responsible. Right. So it's up to us ro to role model it and also to build systems where we can allow um, young physicians to be their best selves in their work. Well, you know, and the team aspect I think is really important mm -hmm. and it gets lost sometimes mm -hmm. because we have such a focus on the electronic medical record and the checklists that have to be filled out mm -hmm. on the pace of, of care, which is all part of the pressure that everybody experiences. Mm -hmm. One of the things we really value here at the Menninger Clinic is that we do have time. Mm -hmm. Patients are here for six to eight weeks, and in fact, we have team approach, so everybody's got help mm -hmm. and gather together to help yeah, each other. That's good. Because it's very hard work when mm -hmm. you really relate to a patient and try to sort out the problems. Mm -hmm. 
we never have enough time on these uh, podcasts mm-hmm. to cover very much, but I want to just finish with one, getting back to the other half. Yeah. What, what's your strategy, I know there's no simple formula for it, of helping people get more comfortable with coming for help, so it's not just to make the, the, the balance of work and the rest of your days mm-hmm. the best it can be, but how do you encourage our own colleagues to say, I have mm-hmm. a problem with depression, mm-hmm. I have a problem with anxiety, mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not concerned if people know that Mm -hmm. uh, because that's compatible with me doing a good job if I get the help that I need. Oh, I think it's one of these things where you have to pat your tummy and rub your head. Uh, (laughs) It's a tough one. I I don't think it's, I don't think it would be fair for me in a position of influence to pretend that there might not be repercussions. Mm -hmm. I think uh, social attitudes uh, are such that there may be repercussions for people to seek help. So, um, and there was this wonderful and, and hard survey of surgeons in this country showing that a significant number contemplate suicide and they never get help because they're afear- afraid of losing, say, their medical license. So I think these, uh, I think these pressures are pretty serious mm-hmm. and still active mm-hmm. in our profession. Mm-hmm. So I think there's only one way, which is you have to create um, a kind of dialogue about the importance of seeking care, helping people themselves be able to recognize when they're in trouble, um, and but then build very, very tightly safeguarded pathways mm-hmm. into care, mm-hmm. confidential, uh, very, very discreet, uh, where the threshold to step, step over is not very high. Mm-hmm. And I hope, you know, in 10 years it'll be different. I, you know, I, I mentioned before my father, when he, was a young practicing physician, cancer was terribly stigmatized. It was considered dirty or that you somehow caused it with your bad behavior. And now I think attitudes toward cancer have really, really changed. I mean, there really is a a kind of a social acceptance and support and empathy for people living with cancer in a way that... That's a huge change. When I was a medical student here at Baylor, my dad died of cancer, and he was told he had six months to live. Mm-hmm. He lived for five years, mm. which was great. Nice, yeah. But he didn't tell anybody. Yeah. So suffering alone, suffering Absolutely. alone. So th- I think it's similar, right, for depression, which is, you know, a huge cause of disease burden throughout the world. I mean, the World Health Organization says that that uh, neuropsychiatric conditions are the second leading leading cause of you know living with disability mm-hmm. in our mm-hmm. world, and um, second only to infectious disease. So, I mean. Many people are suffering in silence. So we have got to find stealthy ways <laughs> to reach people right. and support them. And I think it's especially true in our profession. I wish, I wish we were further along, mm-hmm. but I'm, I, I promise in our careers we'll, we will see this shift. Mm-hmm. Um, we've already seen a big mm-hmm. shift already. But the example of cancer is an important one to, to reflect on. Yeah. And I think the things that made a difference there were recognizing the biological determinants of cancer, um, having greater recognition of those factors that lead to cancer, having it be accurate, that will help us with the same story with, with uh, destigmatizing depression. There's a great billboard that I saw in California that had just a great big headline mm-hmm. that said, imagine if you were told that you caused your cancer. Mm-hmm. And it was about mental health. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Made it clear. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're heading in that direction. Mm-hmm. I do think that depression is out of the closet a little bit. Mm-hmm. People are more comfortable with it. Right. But I like your phrase, we have to sort of figure stealthy ways mm-hmm. uh, to make this better. Mm-hmm. Well, one of, the way to d- one of the ways that can happen is with leadership from people like you, Thank because you. you really are articulate these mm-hmm. kinds of things as you just did. Thank you. We have to stop at this point, but we're looking forward to your lecture later today. Thank um, you. And it's great to have you here. Thanks, John. And thanks again to all of you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.